Amen. Hey, stay, sit, stay up, stay up, stay up. Go ahead and grab your Bibles while you're up. Go ahead and grab them. We're trying to make good work of this. Go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 10 while these young folks are leaving. See you guys. Adios. Luke chapter 10 is where we're going to be. Good to see you. Hey, man, how are you? Like that Boston hat looks good on you, man. What's happening, brother? You doing all right? Yeah, 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 okay, good. But by the way, somebody in the church has lost a phone, uh, and I was going to bring it up here and show it off, uh, but I don't think anybody's going to claim it if it's not theirs. It's a flip phone, Nokia. <laughs> Tyler didn't know what it was. He found it, and he came to me and said, what is this? I said, open it up. Why do you open it? And so anyways, it's a, we, we've, got, we've got your flip phone if you've lost it. <laughs> don't worry, it'll be waiting on you. Uh, Tyler's got it this morning. Luke chapter 10. Uh, so glad that you're here this morning. I have been on vacation, finally back, um, and excited and loaded and ready to go. And this morning, I, I'm trying to make quick work of this because I know if I'd have said that and you sit down and then stand back up. So we're just changing it up just a little bit this morning as we get started. Uh, but uh, we're going to go through a series over the next couple of weeks talking about three things that God wants from you. Three things that God is seeking from you that you can show him that you love him and that you uh, are all about him. Now, the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 27 is where we're going to start. The Bible gives this reference to Deuteronomy and then Jesus validates it. And the Bible goes like this, Luke chapter 10, verse 25, and a lawyer stood up and put him to the test. Isn't that about right? Jesus is now being put to the test. I want you to see what happened right before that. By the way, you, you are going to be put to the test right after great moments in your life. Uh, great things are happening. Look at what just happened. The Bible says in verse 23, turning to the disciples, he said privately. Sometimes people say this, say, I wonder what it was like to be a disciple of Christ. I wonder what it was like to run around with Jesus. I mean, we worship him, we uh, love him, we study him, but what does it really look like to be a disciple of Christ? What was it like to have private moments with Christ? And this is one of those moments. It's captured in Scripture for us because Luke is sharing it with us. And he says, and he said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, blessed are you because you're getting to see things. Now watch. For I say to you that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see. So there was people that had been praying to see what these guys were seeing. These disciples were let in on the inside to be able to see things because they're with Jesus. That the kings and the prophets have been praying to see and they're actually getting to see them firsthand. They're firsthand witnesses to what Jesus is doing. He says, and they did not see them, these kings and these prophets, and to hear the things which you hear and did not hear them. He's saying to these disciples, listen, guys, you are blessed to get the experience with Christ that you're getting. Do you realize what you are getting with Christ? And so all of a sudden, they're enjoying it. They're going, man, this is great. And then immediately a lawyer stands up. They're having a private moment. The disciples are like, yeah, man, this is awesome. Yeah, kings and prophets, they've all been wanting to see this. We're actually getting to see it. And now all of a sudden, a, a, a lawyer stands up, puts Jesus to the test. And he says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And, the, and Jesus says in verse 26, and he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? Verse 27 says the lawyer, and he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Three things that God wants from you this morning from his word. Let's pray. God, I love you. I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for how great it is to be in your house God, I'm so excited about your word this morning, and I pray that as we study your word, that we would learn how to love you the way that you want to be loved. God, you direct us to show you our love back to you, and I pray that we would do that this morning and as we learn over the next several weeks. God, we pray that you would have your way with us, change our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Over the next three weeks, I'm going to do a series starting this week. So over the next two, three things that God wants from you. 
And we're going to talk about the fact that God wants your strength, God wants your mind, and God wants your heart. And then after that, on September 3rd, we're going to relocate LC campus back to this campus. We're going to reinstitute our 930 service. So you'll have the opportunity to come to 930 service or 11 o'clock service, 930 Sunday school or 11 o'clock Sunday school. And somebody said, is my Sunday school class moving? No. Most Sunday school classes are staying the same. So if you like 11 o'clock service, 930 Sunday school, you're good to go. Uh, but there will be opportunities for 11 o'clock if you want to switch to a 930 service. And on that Sunday, on, on September 10th, when we kick those back off, September 3rd, celebration service. And then on September 10th, we go to two services again here, relocate and LC here. Uh, when we start on September 3rd, we are doing a series called Whispers. We're doing a series where uh, one Sunday I'm going to be talking about suicide. What does the Bible say about it? How does it affect people and how do you help people who are dealing with suicide and depression. We're going to talk about the uh, addiction, opioid crisis that we have going on. We're going to talk about alcoholism as it has become a rapid uh, growing uh, reason for deaths uh, in our area. Uh, we, are, we have experienced just in the last week, I know of at least six overdoses from pain pills. And we're going to experience what the Bible talks about with those cases. We're going to talk about divorce and how it affects your family and how it affects you and how some of you are still dealing with divorce uh, and the symptoms of that throughout your life. We're going to talk about sex. We're going to talk about what God intended for it uh, in your life, uh, how you honor God with it, and what happens when it gets out of control in your life. We're going to talk about social media and how you protect your children. We're going to talk about the things that people want to just kind of whisper about, but they don't really want to talk out front about because they don't really know if it's going to offend somebody. And I'm going to wade off into that uh, starting September 3rd, and we're going to get biblical. And some of you are going to say, man, that kind of offended me. And some of you are going to say, good, I'm glad somebody finally said something, but we are going to be biblical in what we do and address the issues because I don't know if you've noticed or not, we are losing our country and our future and our children by keeping silent on the things that are of Christ. And so we're going to go there. We're going to go. We're, we're not, listen, God didn't call me down here to fill the pews or the chairs. He called me down here to fill the pulpit, and that's what we're going to do starting in September. But starting this morning, you're going to need the next three weeks to gear up for the following. But for the next three weeks, we're going to talk about three things that God wants from you. If, if you could say, God wants me to love him, and these are the ways that he wants me to love him, what would you say? And the Bible says in Deuteronomy, and then God confirms it again in Luke when a lawyer uh, reiterates what it is, and Jesus says, you do this and you will have eternal life, you will live. But the Bible says this, it, to love God means this, that you love God with all your heart, and then we put soul in there. Some of them break it up into four categories, but for the purposes of this next series, I'm going to put heart and soul together. You love God with your heart and your soul together, and then the Bible says you love God with your mind. So what does it mean to love God with your heart and soul? Well, I'm glad you asked, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about next week, but it means to love God with your passions. What are you passionate about? How do you use the passions that you have to love God? And, by the way, by the way, look here. If you're not loving God by using your passions, is it a sin? Is it possible that there's some of you in here this morning, you're living a good life, but you're not doing the thing that God's called you to do with your life because you're scared, you feel unworthy, whatever it is, but you're actually, in your refusal to do the passion that God's given you, you're sinning against God. What? Everybody's going to be like, are you sure? Positive. I'll show you next week. And if that made you mad, come on back next week. It's going to be good. And then the Bible says this, that you love God with your mind. What does it mean to love God with your mind? It means to be growing in your knowledge of him, that you should be growing deeper in your walk. You shouldn't be the same man that you were when you were saved. If you've been saved 25 years or 15 years or five months, you should have been growing in your knowledge of who Christ is, and you should be growing deeper. And we're going to talk about that. But then the Bible says to love God in all of your strength. That you would love him in your strength. Have you ever tried to love God with your strength? I mean, when I look at my life and I think, I'm going to love God with my strength, uh, he doesn't have much to work with. You're looking at me. I mean, I'm about 170 on about 5'10 frame when I got high heels on. Uh, I, you know, I got a BMI of about 86%. I don't even know what that means, but it's a lot, right? I, I can't work out well. You know, if I go to the gym and I can do one with the bar, I'm good, dude. I'm good. Whoosh. I mean, that's 45 large right there. I mean, I'm putting it up. 
Come on. And so when God says, Philip, I want you to love me with your strength, I'm going, okay, we'll give it our best shot here. But what does it mean to love God with your strength? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. You say, Philip, why is all this important? Why is it important that we love God the right way? Because some of you are not loving God the way that he wants you to love him. And you're saying, Philip, I've never heard it put that way before. Well, let me put it that way for you because you're not, you're not showing God that you love him according to the standards that he has set forth. In fact, some of us are saying, I'm showing God I love him. I went to church this morning and God's going, okay, so what? So what? There's a whole lot of people in church this morning. Well, I, I love God, and, and I was at Sunday school, and you know how early that was. I mean, it's Sunday, for goodness sakes. Uh, you know I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I showed up on a Wednesday night, or I love Jesus. I threw $20 in the offering plate last week. You know how important that was to me. And God's going, wait a minute. Wait, wait. You're, you're not showing me that you love me the right way. All of those things are good. All those things are great, but those are indirect consequences. And what I'm looking for is for you to show me that you love me. Show me that you love me because by all indications, you are doing what you have to do, what you think is my love language, but you are absolutely not showing me that you love me. So, this morning, if you came to me and said, Philip, me and my spouse are having some marriage issues, would you meet with us? I'm going to say yes. And you're going to come to me and I'm going to play the role of marriage counselor. I use that term loosely because I'm not a professional. In fact, most of the time, if you come to see me, I'm a marriage referee. I am there to hear both sides of the case and to try to find some sort of way that we can reconcile this before someone ends up on Dateline NBC. That's my goal. When you walk in, that's, I've got Dateline in the back of my mind going, how can we work this out? You know, I don't want to be where they've blurred my face out and me speaking. You know, well, I know, you know, I don't want to be that guy. And so you come to me, and you're there, and here's what normally ends up happening if you come to me and uh, you sit down with me for, for just a, a tune-up or whatever. It doesn't mean that you're in dire straits. It just might mean that you need a tune-up. It might just mean that as a husband and wife, you just, you know what, we're just not, I don't know, it's just not jiving, or we're working through this major issue, or maybe we're good, but we don't know how to deal with this. So you come to me, and so here's what we'll do. If you come to me and you sit down and you go, hey, we're here for marriage counseling, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to evaluate, hear your story, where you are. Now, after I realize what we're working with, the immediate next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a profile test called the five love languages. And I do that because you need to know what love is and how you speak it. There was a man named Gary Chapman that wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. If you've never read it, I would encourage you to read it. It's a great read. You say, well, we are doing great in our marriage. I don't need to read it. Read it because it helps you to identify and work with others. And Gary, here's what Gary ended up understanding. He is a marriage psychologist and counselor. And here's what Gary ended up saying. Gary Chapman ended up saying that every single person, everybody you're sitting beside, has a love language. There's a way that they live their life and they interpret whether they are loved or they are not loved. And then they share love a certain way and they receive it. So you speak love away and you receive love away. And that's an important piece of information. Because if you're trying to love somebody and do it right and you want them to feel loved, you want to be speaking the language that they hear. At the same time, if you're trying to love somebody, but they say, well, you're just missing the mark, and you're doing your best, if you could change gears so that they would understand it, you would want to do that so that you could succeed. So Gary said there's five love languages, and he interprets those for each and every person. Now, for me, just to let you know, me, here's me and Mandy. Mandy and I have been married for almost 17 years, a little over 16 years. And so we dated in high school and then didn't date in college and then got married. And so we've been together for quite some time. And a lot of people come together and say, why do you want to get married? Because I love them, right? I, lo I love them, whoever it is. And that works for a minute. And then you eat wedding cake and it all changes. And so you got married on love, but now it feels different. And so me and Mandy got married, and Mandy has come to understand when we look at the love languages, here's what I am. I'm a words of affirmation guy. I am a guy that goes based on the words that I receive. When people encourage me, when people talk good to me, boy, I'm king of the mountain. In fact, on any given day, if I hear 10 great things and one bad thing, I will dwell on the bad thing. 
And so words are very much important to me. If I don't hear words, so see, sometimes people say, well, I I would share this with you, but I don't want to inflate your ego. You don't understand. That's not your judgment call. I'm a guy that needs it because it doesn't inflate my ego. It makes me feel loved, right? And so my my wife has come to understand that in order to love me, the, the way that I interpret love is to speak well to me, to encourage me, to to, to, to talk to me and share good things with me. Now, here's the deal. The worst part about my love language is you can just about talk me into anything. If I believe that you believe that I can do it, I'm in. And that has led to a lot of problems. It's led to a broke collarbone, broke wrist, uh, ripped out lip. I mean, it's, it's ended up in some bad things, you know, because I thought you thought I could do it and I was going to do it, right? And the same way is true, too. When I hear negative Uh, I go negative because I take it personal. Now, my wife, my wife is not a words of affirmation person. I mean, she's fine with it, but guess what? I listen to words of affirmation. That's the way I receive love. So guess what I end up doing? That's how I show love. And so sometimes you will see me and I'll go, hey, man, you had your hair cut? It looks good. That's me loving you. You may not have known that, but that's me. I'm affirming you. Oh, man, I like your new car. I'm affirming you. That comes from me. Why? Because that's the way I interpret it. That's the way I show it. My wife, not so much. I can say, hey, you know, the floors look good. You just mopped them. Thanks. Kids have been terrible all day. It'll just be a minute. And I'm thinking, man, that made me feel good. Not her. My wife is physical touch. Now, before all you men go, all right. No, it's not that. (laughs) Physical touch means this, touchy-feely. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say touchy-feely? My wife is a hand holder. She's an arm around her. She's a sit right next to you. Uh, She's touchy-feely. She's all, in fact, you saw this morning, she was holding Memphis. She's touchy-feely. That's how she shows love. And so that's how she receives love. The problem is, is after I've had a day at work or done this or been around everybody, I like to come in and I'm touchy-feely with my lazy boy. And that's it. I'm good. And so I can get up and she go, how was your day? It was good, good, whatever, whatever. She says something nice to me. I encourage her back. And then we go to bed and I've not kissed her on the cheek, kissed her or whatever, and held her hand, done any of that stuff. And guess what she thinks? He doesn't love me. He doesn't love me. Or if I get up in the morning and I'm headed out to work, I got a big day ahead, she might say something like this. You know, you left that trash here yesterday. You think you could take it off today? I'm not feeling loved. Kill the woman. Right? Because we're speaking two different languages. Just so happens over the course of 16 years, there's been a lot of struggles back and forth to try to figure out the love language. But now we feel like we have at least been gifted with now learning. It doesn't come natural. Now we learn to speak each other's love language. And so here's what I know. We can be riding down the road. There could be World War III isn't coming in North Korea. It happens in that Yukon Denali every Sunday when we leave church. Kim Jong-un ain't got nothing on my family. They setting off nukes all the way on. But when it's going down and my wife's getting stirred up, guess what? Reach right across the console, grab her hand. Love. Points went through the roof. Why? Because homeboy's been reading five love languages and I got this, right? She goes, I'm so glad you love me. I go, yeah, I know. Right? Why? Because I'm speaking her love language. You say, Phil, why would you say that? Because here's what I want you to understand. I use that illustration to say this, God has a love language. God has a way that he interprets the way that you love him. That some of us in here may be thinking that we're speaking God's love language, but you're missing the boat. See, some of us may be saying, I'm I'm trying to show God that I love him. I get up on Sunday mornings and go to church, but that's it. And God's not impressed, right? I get up every day and I go to work and put money in the bank. Surely Mandy knows I love her, but that's not it. I haven't held her hand in weeks. I get up every Sunday and I try to go to Sunday school. Surely God knows that I love him. Hey, I get up and I've taken her car and had it cleaned and waxed and I drop it off for her because I know how important it is that that thing looks good while she drives around and she's not feeling a bit loved. She's appreciative and she's thankful for it, but her love meter is going down. Guess what? Same thing happens with God. And so we, we ascribe ourselves to doing all these things for God, but we're missing the mark on showing him that we love him. And he says, listen, it's so easy And most every wife that has ever walked in my office, here's what they would say to their husband. It is so easy. 
I, I am so easy to love. All you have to do is this, 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 and this, and I'm easy. And every man that has ever sat on my couch and talked to me said, you can't satisfy that woman. I, I, you know, I bought this, I did this, we went here, I did this, I'm up to my eyeballs and that, and she, she, she don't appreciate nothing. And you know what happens? Is we get off the mark because we're missing the mark of our love language, and God is the same way. So some of us would say, I've been doing my best to have a relationship with Christ. I've been doing my best to show him that I love him. I've been show, doing my best to live the way that he wants me to, but you've been missing the mark. So... He's not seeing the love that you have towards him, and you feel frustrated like you can never please God. So what's the three things that God wants from you? I'm going to give you this, and I hope that you're taking notes because this is so important. I'm telling you, when I see Christ face to face, I don't want him to look at me and go, that was a good shot, but man, you didn't love me worth nothing, dude. I mean, you went and did a lot of stuff, but you missed the mark. When I meet Christ face to face, I want him to throw his arms around me and say, thank you for loving me until you saw me. I want to get it right. I want to get it right. So what's a couple of ways? Well, we're going to talk about these over the next three weeks. Number one, here's what he says. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And we're going to put those two together. God wants you to love him through your passions. He wants you to be activated in the passions that he's given you. It's not good enough to have those passions and not use them. He wants you to use them for his glory. And by the way, when you are operating in the passions that God's given you, you are making much of him. And when you're doing it, even if you're failing at the passions that he's given you, he says, that guy loves me. He's doing his best to make much of me through his passions. And then God wants you to love him through your mind. He wants you to know him. If every time I referred to my wife, I referred to her as I knew her in high school. If all the time I ever talked about was what we did in high school and where we went and our dates and look at these pictures, Mandy's eventually going to say, hey, honey, I've had five kids since then, all yours. I mean, why don't we talk about something current? We've lived in a couple of different houses. We bought a couple of different houses. Why don't we talk about, yeah, but, but high school was awesome. She would say, you have not grown with me. She would say, I have changed since we've been married. You have not known me any deeper than you knew me at age 16 and 17. Uh, I, am, I am different now. God expects us to grow in our knowledge of him. And unfortunately, there are some that are going to bust heaven wide open. You don't know any more about Christ than, you, than the day that you were saved. And can I explain something to you this morning? That's a sin. It's not good enough just to accept him as your savior and just stay right where you are and never change. It is expected that you would come to know him and then grow in him. And we're going to talk about that. In fact, your spiritual growth is an indicator of how much you love him. And then number three is this, and this is the one we're going to do this morning. Because if I put this one on the ouch, you'll skip that Sunday. So I was going to surprise you with this one. The Bible says to love God with all of your strength. That in order to show God that we love him, we would love him in a such a way that we would love him through our strength. That there's a way that you show up and you say, I'm not only going to love you with my heart and my passions, I'm not only going to love you with my mind, but I'm going to give you my strength. I'm going to get behind something and make it happen. What is strength? Strength means you can move something. Strength means you can make something happen. Strength means I'm calling in the reinforcements and we're going to go strong right here. Strength means I'm going to move the needle. So when God says, I want you to love me with your strength, he's saying, I need you to move the needle. But the only way you're ever going to move the needle for my love is not from physical strength. Aren't you thankful? Some of y'all need to look around and say, I'm so thankful that he's not judging me based on my physical strength. What does he mean by strength? Well, let me give you these words. You ready? Your strength, the word strength, literally means might, M-I-G-H-T. When you break it down in the Greek, it means very. Well, that's hard to interpret. And love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and very. <laughs> okay. I don't know what a very is. Literally, very means power. I want to love God with my might, my strength, my power. Now watch. Y'all ready? When you break down power, strength, very, might, we're still not understanding it. How are you going to go out here and be strong for Jesus? I mean, really, what are we all going to do? Push-ups? Push-up Tuesday. <laughs> Wealth. 
Jesus says, love me with your wealth. You say, well, I don't know if I agree with that. Hang on. Your wealth is your strength. Your wealth is your strength. You are as strong personally and where you want to go as your wallet will allow you. You say, well, I don't agree with that. Well, it's true. You can make claims. You can do whatever. You can want a bigger house. You can go over here. You can want a new car. Let me tell you something. If you don't have any strength in that back pocket, it don't matter. In fact, the credit companies are going to rate you on the strength of your credit. I just messed up everybody's lunch right then, didn't I? Right? And they've got a meter for it. And Jesus says this. He says as, uh, to Deuteronomy, the lawyer does it. And Jesus says, you get that right and you'll have life. Here's what Christ says. Christ says, here's the way you love me is with your heart, with your mind, and with your wealth. God really wants my wealth. He absolutely wants my wealth. You know what the word he uses for wealth is? The wealth, might, strength, Greek meaning uh, power, Aramaic meaning wealth, comes out to the word, what is Generosity. God wants you to love him with your generosity. He wants us to be a church that is so generous. Now watch. Some of you are already ticked off. You're already mad. I used wealth. I haven't said money yet, but let me go ahead and say that. Money. Y'all good? I'm talking about George. I'm talking about Ben. All of them. Get the presidents out. You're already mad. Golly, there ain't no place for that in church. Can I tell you something? If that's your attitude, you're going to be sorely disappointed when you get to heaven. I didn't write the scriptures. You can get mad at me all you want to. You walk out of here and say, that preacher, that's all he ever talks about is money. I, that's fine. You go ahead and do that. But I need one of them grovers to walk up, throw your arm around and say, it wasn't the preacher, it's Jesus, and he won't steal after your money. You can keep bad mouthing that preacher all you want to and be as stingy as you want to. If you're saved, you're going to see him. And the first thing Christ is going to do to you is when you get there, he's going to say, can I see your wallet? <laughs> see, because here's what Christ knows. Christ knows it's one thing to give him your heart. It's one thing to give him your mind. It's another thing to give him your strength. See, you can commit your mind and your heart to Christ and still hold out from him. But when you commit your mind and your heart to Christ and then you back it up with your strength, your financial resources, you can really make the movement of God happen. See, you can act like you want a movement of God and then not really want to get into your strength and it never gets off the ground. But the only way to get the strength up and get the things going on is when we reinforce it with our generosity. And so let me ask you a question. Are you a generous person? That's what he's asking. Are you generous? When it comes to me, are you generous? Let me put it in words that you understand. Anybody ever bought a box of Krispy Kreme donuts? You see the last one laying in there? It's a dog fight. You ever gone to Krispy Kreme when it said hot and ready on the sign? And you get out of the car and go in. Because Krispy Kreme is a phenomenal com uh, company that knows how to entice you to desire. And they take those nice little fluffy buns of delicious, no calorie because Jesus blessed them, donuts. And they go on a little ride. You ever stood back there? Now, I got ADD and I can get into this big time. But you see that thing come out and go, and there it is. There's a new donut. And it gets on a conveyor belt and it's going down the thing. And you're watching it. And I'm thinking, that's my hot and ready. It's about to be hot and ready, right? Here it goes. And I'm watching that little donut because here's what I know. That donut's lifespan is going to be all of about five minutes because when it gets to the place where it Spits it out, it's going in my belly. And so I'm watching it, and here it goes. And it goes from just a little white thing, and now it goes through the oven. It comes out, and it's golden brown, and you're going, all right. And that little donut, it's just riding along. And he's in donut land. He don't know this big mouse coming for him, and he's just rolling along. And then we get to the best part of Krispy Kreme, right? It's that whole thing that looks like a car wash, but it ain't a car wash at all. Oh, it's sweet nectar from Jesus Almighty. <laughs> It's called the glaze. I mean, listen, if they would come up with one of those out here, we would walk through it ourselves. And so it's just running. And you see your little donut, and you know his life's about to die, and he's just rolling on the conveyor belt, and the kids are going, can I get sprinkles? Can I? And you're like, just shut up. I'm watching this. This is, I'm having a moment, and it's coming, and it's coming, and that glaze is going. And all of a sudden, it gets to the, the moment where the donut that you're about to consume hits the glaze, and it goes through it, and it's dull. And it comes out on the other side, and it's, it's got gla it's a glazed donut and it's hot. 
And that little girl, she's got that box flipped up, that white with the green dots that says Krispy Kreme all over it. She's back there, and she's got her gloves on, hopefully. And she's going, one and two and three and four and do, 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 do. And she's putting them in there, and she flops that box down, and she spins it around, puts it back on the counter, and you're already out there. She could say $473. You don't care. You've already slept your card and are ready and before she gives you the receipt the box is back open two fingers because you got to grab a Krispy Kreme with the two finger pinch and you go in for the pinch and you get it and it's still hot still soft and you go all the way down and you bring it over here and boom and you don't care you're just eating it and that little flaky part that dried first it breaks off and it falls right here and she's going, your receipt, sir. And you're like, okay, okay, okay. And you're trying to get this, but you don't flick it off. Oh, no. That thing going right back in there. <laughs> mm. And you know as well as I do, you can buy one dozen, but you never buy one dozen. You buy two. The first dozen is for the ride home. <laughs> the second is for in the morning, right? That's what it means. I mean, that is there. You're loving it. You're eating it. It's all about it. And the moment there's one last donut, it is a fist fight. I say, are you generous? Absolutely. But you're not. I mean, when we come down to it, being generous is hard. It's hard to be generous, especially when we want something that bad. It's hard to be generous. There's not one person that gets the donut box and spins around and goes, everybody get one, everybody get one. No, 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 no. You got your phone right? And generosity goes first, but consumerism makes us go first. So what does it mean to be a generosity person? Well, we need to know what generosity is, and I'm going to give you some definitions here real quick. Generosity, y'all ready? Now I'm going to give you 10 points. <laughs> Generosity means this, readiness or liberality in giving. You're liberal in your giving. You're ready to give. You're generous. Generous people, if you're walking in generosity, are constantly looking for ways to give. Now, they don't promote it that way. They've just got a generous heart, and they are ready to give. This is a definition of generosity. So when you talk about in your generosity, it means... I'm ready to give. You don't have to talk me into it. I'm already there, right? You, you, you understand the liberality of your giving. You, you know what that looks like. It's like when you're taking up a collection at work to buy something for a coworker because they're in need, and then you get over there, and you're wanting everybody to throw in $5, but there's that one guy that goes, look, dude, just take 20 or take 40 and they go, no, well, we don't need that much. I mean, everybody's giving. And you go, no, I want to give to it. Why? Because they're generous. They're giving liberally. Why well, don't make sense? Why are you giving 40? Everybody else gave five. You might as well not even have that conversation. This person is so generous. They're not taking the money back. They're generous. Their generous heart is in a way. That's generosity, right? Not only does generosity mean ready to give, meaning this, if you're generous, most of the time you're not going, let me think about it. Generous people just say, okay, I'm in. I didn't tell you how much yet. I don't, just, I'm in. Generous not only has a positive implication, generosity also has a negative connotation. You need to get this too. What does it mean to have a negative connotation? Generosity not only says this is what you are, generosity says this is what you're not. What does it mean? If you're a generous person, you, and you can look it up for yourself. This is the definition. Generosity is freedom from, negative, from, means this. If I'm generous, I'm free from this, what's about to happen. I'm freedom, free from meanness, Ain't that a good word to look up in the definition? What does meanness mean? Well, you know what meanness is. You've seen it. I'm free from meanness or smallness of mind. See, here's what you don't realize is when you're not generous and you hear a pastor up here talking about generosity and you've already shut me down. That's fine. That is fine. You go ahead and do that and you walk right out of here the way you walked in. That's fine. That's okay. But I'm just telling you spiritually speaking and from a physical understanding, you are holding yourself hostage. You've got a small mind, dude. You're not the guy we're trying to get on board to change kids' lives. You're bound up. The Bible says bondage breaker. I'll tell you what, bondage breaking is not just for people who are addicted. Bondage breaking is for people who are stingy. So now you're meddling. I'm not meddling at all. What I'm trying to tell you is, is you've got yourself held captured, and the only thing that you can see is George Washington. And so it says you're free from that, smallness of mind. And then here's what it says. It's largeness, fullness, amplitude. That's what generosity means. Now, if I'm talking to you this morning, before I get to my 10 points, if I'm talking to you this morning, you say, Philip, okay, all right, okay, I'm starting to get it. 
I know you're going to give me these points. Christ wants my generosity, and quite frankly, we haven't been given at all. We're not, I mean, I think of myself as generous, but financially speaking, we haven't been giving. Are you talking simply about money this morning? I am talking about your finances. You, listen to me, listen to me. You, don't, you can get mad at me if you want to. I'm just a spokesman. If you want to consider yourself generous and an obedient Christian, but you don't give to the cause of Christ, you're neither. Did you hear that? Now listen to me. And if you're sitting here and God has blessed you and you're giving stingily, new word, then you're not generous and back to point A. If you're not giving generously out of your strength and finances and resources, then you're not an obedient Christian and you're not generous. You say, well, I disagree. Okay, that's fine. I, okay, you're more than welcome. I've got a lot of years in studying this thing. I've studied it upside down and sideways. You feel free to go get it. I'll meet with you. And you can prove me wrong, and I will print a redaction here on Sunday morning. But if I'm right, get your checkbook out. I'm going to help you get obedient. I don't get so serious. I'm going to go, you're already mad. Okay, whatever. So here's the deal is we want to be generous. Now, here you say, okay, so I, I want to be that. I just hadn't heard about it, and you know, I'm new to church and all that stuff. Listen, don't hear me preaching mad. Hear me preaching encouragement because I want you to love God the right way. I want you to be generous in your giving. I want you to be generous in your life. So what do we do? Well, Philip, all I've ever heard is 10%. I want to give 10% or I need to give 10% tithes and offerings. And I would say to you, that's a general understanding. People use 10%, um, but realistically, it's probably more than that in the New Testament. And you don't really hear us use a percentage around here. here Here's what I would say to you is I would say use 10% as a good target. Uh, but for some of you to give 10% would not mean nothing to you. And God would expect more out of you because to be generous is a sliding scale. For some people to give generously, it'd be $2. For some to give less than 10,000 would not be generous. It's a sliding scale. And so you say, well, I can't be generous because I'm telling you, we're up to our eyeballs in debt. And if you ask for 10% of what we make right now, we can't do it. And I completely under understand. I've got kids of my own. I understand how difficult it is. But here's what I would say to you. You may not be able to do 10%, but it's time you start with something. Generosity never creates itself. So if your thought is, well, I'm going to get this paid off, I'm going to get this raised, and then I'm going to get generous, Can, listen to me, listen to me, learn from me. If that's your thought process, you'll never be generous. Never. You know why? Because some of you got to where you are now thinking that same way, but all you are is deeper in debt. Anytime I've ever gotten a raise or my money's gone up or whatever, guess what else has? My expenses. My lifestyle. I've never been kind of going up and thought, hey, you know what? Let's just stop where we are, and I'll just start giving more to the church. Because generosity doesn't, doesn't naturally happen. So what do you have to do? You have to change the bell curve. And so what you have to do is you have to stop and go, okay, I want to be generous. I can't start with 10%, and 1% is going to push me, but I'm really going to start, and then we're going to start working to where uh, we can become generous in our giving. Why? Because that preacher told you to? No, because God said, if you love me, show me. See, everybody gets all tense about money. Isn't that weird? Preachers are scared to death to talk about money because y'all going to leave and go away. I'm not scared no more. Let me tell you why. Can I give you an, can I, can I show you? My heart is so hopeful this morning. I've been gone three weeks. I don't know if this is what you signed up for when I got back, but here it is. My heart is so hopeful. My heart says, and Christ was just working on it. I said, God, I want the growth to be generous. I want us to have a generous heart. Can you imagine what we can do if we were generous? And you say, well, are we not generous now? Not all of us. We're not. In fact, here's what I know. We have 365 units, family units in the church. Now, 365 could mean two or seven, right? We're a unit, but that unit accounts for seven. The average would be about four. We have 365 units times four. You do the math that come to the Grove. You say, well, they're not all here this morning. No, they never all show up at the same time because you guys are weird. <laughs> Somebody's pulling in from, into town from vacation. Another one's going on vacation, right? One person's season just ended. Another one's just started. That's just the way we are, but we are a wide church. We are a broad church. Out of those 365 units, only 75 units give. Give. 
I'm just going to leave that there. We have 365 units times four. Out of that, 365, only 75 units give. Of those 75 units that give, this church will take in right at $700,000 for general budget. That's what we operate this church out of. Now, some of y'all come from a small church and go, wow, 700000 Can I explain this to you? That's not a lot of money. In fact, by the time you pay expenses, pay staff, pay utilities, it's not a lot of money. $700,000 is what this 75 unit do. Not only do they do that, but then they give extra at Easter, and that's another 150000 So now we're getting up about eight fifty. That's still not a lot of money. In fact, it's separated. You got missions and you got general budget. With the money that is given from those units, and you hear me say this to you, 75, and you know who you are. Those families know who they are. Uh, you individuals know who you are. Thank you. You are changing the world. You say, well, I don't know if we are or not. Yes, you are. You're changing it. See, when God says, love the, heart, love the, love the Lord your, your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, what he says is when you do that, not only will I change you, I'll change the world. See, because we stand all day and say, we love Jesus, we love Jesus, but if we don't have any strength to back it up, who cares? You can say you want to see a change in your community, but if you're not willing to put your money where your mouth is, who cares? You could be loaded and ready to go, but if nobody's going to play, pay for the fuel to put it in the plane, the plane's going to stay grounded. So 75 of y'all come in and say, we got to get this thing up off the ground. You know what you were able to do? There's a letter sitting on my desk this morning from uh, the president of the TBC, uh, the TBC. In the Tennessee, uh, the whole state of Tennessee, there's 66 Baptist associations. This is just Baptist. 66 Baptist so associations. We're part of the Big Emory Baptist Association. So there's 66 throughout the whole state. There's over 3,200 churches, Baptist churches, in the whole state of Tennessee. So you go from Johnson City all the way out to Memphis, there's 3,200 Baptist churches churches. Did you realize that the Grove, the one that you're sitting in this morning, right here in Rome County, is in the top 100 in the whole state in salvations? You may not care. I care. You know why? Because the whole state, too, is in decline. You're on the upswing. Not only are you in the top 100, he wrote me a nice letter and just said, I just want to thank you for what you're doing down there. Tell the Grove to keep going. We've got more people to save. we got more people to lead into Christ. And I go, Yeah! And if you don't think so, go home and turn on your news and watch these white people beat each other up over the color of people's skin. It's disgusting. We've got to pierce the darkness. In that, you've got a top five rated student ministry. Top five in all of Tennessee. Some of y'all have never gone to a bad church before. You don't know what it's like to go to a good one. You're in the top 100 and the top five in Rome County. Get out of here. You were doing it. We've got a PDO where people can come drop their kids off and learn. We've got a dream for the Grove Christian Academy, and we've got things that are coming up through there. We've got the best children's ministry in the area by far. We've got a daycare that is unbelievable. We've got plans right now to start a kindergarten through second grade at our Christian Academy. And I was told this week it would be just as easy if you wanted to to do kindergarten through fifth grade while we're doing it because we could probably fill the spots. And, of course, your pastor's going, let's do it. I'm ready. I'll be Billy Madison. I'll go back to school. Whatever. I'll do it. Right? You have been able to start a thing called a step study program through Celebrate Recovery on Wednesday night. You say, is that important? In the past seven days... There's been over six overdoses in our area to drugs. You're doing it on $700,000 a year. Do you realize that if we just had 75 more units out of 365, that's just 150, that we would double it? Do you know what we could do if everyone was generous in their giving and we had a budget of $1.3 million? Do you know how many more kids would be saved? You say, Philip, you're making me uncomfortable talking about money. Why? Why? You're acting like your wife didn't come in and go, you know what we could do with an extra $1,000 a month? Why are you changing the standard for Jesus? Don't you do that. Christ didn't teach you that way. Do you know what we could do? If we were generous, if we had everybody looking together and going, hey, I'm going to be generous. You're going to be generous. I'm going to be generous. Let's all be generous. And we all start putting in here. We start to bust through. Do you realize that we could forever change not only our community, but our state, our church? 
It's amazing to me what God has already done through the generosity of this church. And it's amazing to me the possibility of generosity over here and how he could change it. Say, well, when are you going to start that school? When we get generous. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I'll pay for me. <laughs> he said, well, well, we'll figure it out. I'm just, I'm up to my eyeballs in debt right now. And I appreciate everything you're saying. Okay, that's fine. Just, you know what? Look at you. Look. So what do generous people do? What do generous people do? Number one, y'all ready? I got just a few minutes. Is it hot in here? Well, you know what? If we were generous, we'd get our air conditioner fixed. (laughs) That's a fact. That's a fact. Ask children. They've been up there in the heat. Why? Because we got two units down. We had $10,000 in a hole over here. People say, when are you going to build that new church? We were raising more than $700,000 a year. Good night. Let's go. He said, well, if you want me to be generous, I'm going to have to sell something. Brother, I'll get the sign. Let's sell it. Do you know what we can do for Christ? Do you know? I'm telling you, the jet plane is sitting on the tracks. It's ready to go. It's ready. And Jesus says, here's the key, guys. Here's the key. Don't just love me with your heart. Don't just love me with your mind. We're going to talk about it. But love me with your strength. How do we become strong? How do we become a strong church? We become a strong church by taking the resources that we all have and putting them together to do more. You know it's true. You do it in your private life. One of you has a friend and two or three of you come together and pitch in to make something happen for your friend. Here's what I'm saying. We've got a friend that's called community. We've got a Savior called Jesus. We all need to pitch in generously to make it happen. I'm just excited. I'm not mad at all. I'm walking out here going, this is what we are doing. This is what we could do. Get them pumped up. Generous people, watch this, number one, right out the gate. Generous people. And I am sweating like Bruce Pearl. Generous people often give more than they are asked to give. You want to know if you're generous? Generous people often give more than they are asked to give. This is a standard that God has implemented. You say, I don't think that's scriptural. Yeah, it is. So well, I'm going to give 10%. That's what I'm going to give. Well, I'm just telling you, generous people, you're a giver, but you're not generous. You're saying, can I be a, gener- a giver and not generous? Absolutely. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can be a giver and not I mean, some of you are tippers, but you're not a generous tipper. Or did you pass, did you give a dollar? Yeah, you did. So technically, you're a tipper. Did you give more than that? No, you're not a generous. You, you see what I'm saying? And so the Bible says this, generous people give, often give more than they are asked to give. You say, what does that mean? Exodus 36, verse through, uh, 1 through 7, just so that you know, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm going to Scripture. Exodus 36 tells us the story of Moses. Moses is building a sanctuary. He gets with his guys, gets with the foreman. He says, let's tell them what all we need to build this sanctuary. So they start saying, hey, here's what we need to do. We got a vision, we've got a sanctuary. Grove's got a vision, we got a future. We got the Grove Academy, we want to pierce the darkness for drugs and addiction. We want to go reach people where they are. We want to be able to do things for folks. And everybody says, okay, let's do it. Let's, re- let's combine resources. I've got a little bit, I've got a little bit, and a whole lot of little bits turn into a whole lot, a lot of bit. And here's what happens is they start to build and, and take all the stuff in for the sanctuary. And the foreman goes back to Moses and he says to Moses, he says, Moses, you're going to tell the people to stop giving because they've given so much now. We can't spend what they've given us. We'll never be able to use it. In fact, they've got another truckload of stuff coming down here today. I can't use it. And the Bible says they were so jacked up for the mission that they just started throwing everything that they had at it. They were so excited to get it done that Moses literally went back to the people in Exodus 36, and he says, the Bible says, he restrained them from giving. Now, wouldn't that be something? I'm telling you, I pray this all the time. I wish I'd be having lunch on Monday or Tuesday, and one of them other pastors say, how was it on Sunday? And I say, listen, I'm not bragging. I just got to tell you something. What? We come time to do our offering, and I finally just said, stop! Were they mad? No! They were throwing so much money in there, it was unbelievable! You made them stop giving? Yeah! Yeah! I guarantee you, if you ever get to that point, I'll make it as public as I can. I'll brag on you. I'll brag. I'll, hey, listen, we'll be like Pablo Escobar. I'll get buckets. We'll bury it out back. We'll do whatever we have to do to make it known. You know what the Bible teaches us? Generous people, they give more than is off, they're often asked to give. That's liberally. Number two, generous people give in response to a great cause. 
generous people. See, some, listen to me, I'm going to say this, this is going to fall on you. Some of you, this is going to sting you, but let it sting you. And let it sting you from me as opposed to meeting Christ one day and you get stung eternally. Some of you have been blessed beyond measure. You have bank accounts that are way big and you give little. You give little, right? Sometimes people say, well, that church down there, they give more because they got some big hitters in it. They got some big folks in it. Listen to me. The Grove has some big boys in it too. They don't give like big boys, right? And so the Bible teaches us that generous people give in response to a great cause. So what happens is, is people that are not generous say, I'm going to sit on it till I find something that's a good cause, and then I'll give to it. Generous people give to that great cause, and here's what I'm about to tell you. You just help me on this because I've been studying this real hard. I can't think of a cause that's any better than Christ. If you're waiting on me to wow you with a cause, I'm out. Generous people give. Why are you so generous down there? You gave crazy money the other other day. You gave crazy uh, last year. Why did you do that? Because of Jesus Christ. You know what Molly was worth? She's priceless to her family. To you, she's $80,000. Out of $700,000 you'll give this year, $80,000 is all you'll spend on ministry. Just let that lay there. By the time we pay all of our bills. But generous people give in response to a great cause. And, and sometimes I look and I say, well, only 75 people are given. There's almost 300 units that just say this ain't a cause worthy enough to give to. Number three, generous people give out of their substance, whether it's large or small. Jesus talks about the widow She gave out of her substance. See, some people say, I want to be generous, but I'll give when I have more resources. You don't give out of your surplus. You give out of your substance. See, that's what generosity is. You can't claim to have generosity if you're giving over here out of your surplus. You never feel it. Generosity, there's a feeling behind it. I want to give out of my substance. This is who I am. I'm giving out of that. The widow gave out of her substance, not what she didn't have. She gave out of her substance. She gave her might. I had a guy walk in my office the other day. I'm about to finish up. I had a guy walk in my office the other day. And uh, he scheduled a meeting with me. He walked in. He said, my name's Dickie Maddox. And I said, okay, tall guy. Had his wife, had his daughter. And I told him I was going to share this because he listened to me online. He said, uh, I'd like to meet with you. I said, okay. So we walked in my office and he sat down. He said, Philip, my dad's name's Ray Maddox. He used to pastor his church. I said, get out of here. He said, yes, sir. He said, me and my wife, we live in Jupiter, Florida now. He said, one day we hope to relocate back here. He said, but I got to be honest with you. He said, uh, I didn't always do what God wanted me to. And in fact, I got way out there. But since I've been gone, man, I've fallen in love with Jesus. I love my wife. love my daughter. He said, I love my dad. He said, you know what? He said, uh, I came and visited my dad. He's in a nursing home now. And I said, I know who your dad is. I said, I've heard about him. He laid the foundation for what we're doing now. He said, uh, and I was talking to him, he said, my dad, Ray, is not responsive, really kind of communicate. He's there, but he can't really communicate like he used to. And he said, I was talking about you in the church. I said, what'd you tell your dad? <laughs> and he said, I got to be honest with you. He said, I got people that talk out of, you know, Kingston, and some people say this about the Grove, and they change the name and all that stuff, and all these other people. He said, but I've been watching you online. And he said, I told my dad, after hearing what's going on in Kingston, and after seeing what you guys are doing, He said, I told my dad he'd be proud of the church that he used to pastor and what it's become. And he said, and while I was sitting there talking to him, he said, I decided I wanted to come see you. And I said, well, I'm glad you did. Now, he's a big man. I had no idea what he's going to say. He said, we're going to go back home to Jupiter, Florida. He said, but let me encourage you. He said, what you're doing here is phenomenal. And he said, I grew up here days gone by, and I wasted a lot of time. He said, but one day I hope to be back up here and to join you in the cause. Here's what he did. Dickie Maddox, a man of moderate means, he said, we're going back to Jupiter. He said, but can I write you a check? (laughs) Don't be so spiritual. Y'all ain't wanting to laugh, but that's worth laughing at. I said, you need a pen? (laughs) (laughs) And right there with his daughter and his wife, He said, Philip, I want to go ahead and get on board with what you're doing for the future of the Grove. Let me give you this check and use it for the cause of Christ here. 
What a generous man. May never feel the consequence of his giving, but it is going to impact the future. And by the way, his dad was laying the foundation for that young man to one day walk back in here and generously give to this body. I'd like to tell you it was a million dollars. It was not. There's still room for you to give. But that's what generosity, <laughs> that's what generosity looks like. I stood up and looked out my little window and I watched him drive out and there was a Florida license plate on it. And I said, man, God had to send a guy from Jupiter, Florida to fill the shoes for some 300 units that are right here partaking. Let me go ahead and say this. If you don't think the Grove's going to get it done without you, he'll send them from all over America to make sure it happens. I'm serious about where we're headed. But boy, it sure would help if we'd all be generous. And if you're the 75 unit that's given, you need to be praying like me. And you ought to be praying right now. Get them. Because we need the help. Generous people give more than their money. They give more than their money. You know this. Some of your coaches, you know this. You give. You're generous. You give. If you coach, you give. And you give money. You buy the helmets, the bass, the whatever if they're needed. But then you give your time. Generous people not only give of their money, but they give of their time. A good indicator of whether you're generous all the way around and give liberally is not only do you give with your finances, but do you give with the rest of yourself. By the way, you can't just give with yourself and not your finances. See, some people are going to say, well, I'm just going to do this and that's going to be my generosity. Let me explain something to you. You can't love God with just your mind and your heart and leave your strength, your wealth out. You can't do it. Because if you don't love God also with your wealth, He never had your mind or your heart. See, naturally when God gets a hold of your mind and your heart, your wealth follows. You say, prove it. Okay, I married my wife. Can you imagine me being married to her for 16 years and never spending a dollar on her? I know your love language, babe. Hold my hand. Don't worry. I'll take care of the utility bill. She's got needs. Well, I earn my own money. I made this. You got my heart, babe. You know what I'm going to have? Her fist dead in my face. See, you can't do it. See, I'm helping you this morning. Don't hear an angry pastor. Don't shut me out because we said money. Lean in as a good Christian. Lean in at the feet of Christ. And here's what he says. If you're serious about your mind and heart, get your wallet out. By the way, here's what I found too. Is maybe I wouldn't be in the dire straits that I had if I'd have let him be the owner of my finances. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Mm. Number five, generous people give even when it doesn't make sense. You ever had to give and it not make sense? I don't know why we're doing this. <laughs> so, well, you connect that to Scripture? Absolutely. Joseph was in jail for 13 years, accused of rape. His brother set the whole thing up. They get down on their luck. They can't feed themselves, and they walk into the court, walk into the palace. Guess who's on the throne? They've got to be fed. Guess who's got to do it? The one that they sold into slavery and paid the price for an accusation that he never did. He gave to them more than they ever needed. That don't make sense. Why are we going to help them? They ought to, need, they ought to get a job. Generous people give even when it doesn't make sense. Number six, generous people. Come on, JT. Generous people give to uh, help others even when they, have different, they, when they differ from one another. Luke 7 says this. God is about to heal a slave in Luke 7. And that slave was of a different faith than the Jewish synagogue that he built. See, sometimes you give to people who are different from one another. Generous people give to all kinds of different people. Generous people give to see the impossible become possible. So I'm generous and I keep giving. You're the only one giving. I'm giving. Why you keep giving? I'm giving because I want to see the impossible become possible. The boy with the five loaves and the fishes, Jesus had to, he had to feed 5,000. And there was one little dude go, I got some bread and fish. Jesus said, that's a good start. I'll take it. See, you give. Start, start, start. Generous people give a by, a by, as a byproduct of their own personal transformation. I'm generous. Mandy gets on to me all the time. 
Mandy gets on to me all the time because we'll start looking and, you know, I've got five kids, so it's not like we run with a big surplus, right? I, I spent almost $200 yesterday in girdles for football, not just girdles. <laughs> uh, dad bod. Uh, we understand what the pain is. We get it. But you know what happens if you ever go out to eat with me or whatever, immediately I'm trying to pay for everybody's food. I'm trying to do all this stuff. And my wife's always going, you have got to stop buying everybody's lunch. My staff will tell you. Why do you do that, Philip? Are you bra- I'm not bragging on myself. You know why I do it? Because I've walked in that restaurant before and not have two pennies. I know what it feels like. I've got a few more than two pennies now. And I pay. Guys, I'm just telling you, why don't you walk in here and give out of the generosity that Jesus Christ gave you more than two pennies from the cross? And he wants to give it to others. I'm just telling you, I don't care what you do, I'm going to give over and above because of what Jesus Christ did for me. He's transformed my life. But not only that, generous people give when others will not. I don't know why you're giving. Ain't nobody else. You ain't going to stop me. I'm generous. And then number 10, I told you I'd get 10 in. Bam! Generous people give out of their own poverty. What does that mean? It means they give out of their own poverty. It means to be generous. Listen, if you think to be generous, you have to be rich. You don't. If you don't give generously when you're broke, you'll never give generously when you're rich. Generosity is not about the extra money you have. It's about what you have and you give it. That's why you can see somebody that's broke as a joke and they give. That's why sometimes you see people from Kingston Forum, we've seen this happen. We go down to help somebody in a hard moment of their life. They get on board and they're the first ones to bring the bags of canned goods for those that we're trying to give who need uh, food during Thanksgiving. And we go, no, 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 don't bring that. Take it home with you. We're going to bring you more. No, no, I want to be a part of it. You've given to me. I want to give back. So generous people give out of poverty. Now, I walked in with this hat this morning. And a lot of y'all think my hair's getting too long anyways. I ain't giving up. I'm going all the way Jesus. <laughs> Somebody said, are you growing out that facial hair? Jesus saves and shaves, man. Listen. Somebody said, you look dirty when you grow that facial hair out, and it just lit a fire under me, and I said, I'll, I, listen, no shave November's, I'm coming for you. And then y'all saw this hat and said, what is he, Indiana Jones? You don't appreciate what this hat means, and that's why I'm holding it like this. You do not understand the sacrifice of this hat. This hat, most of y'all wouldn't wear it. I'm not going to wear it. just doesn't fit my motif, right? And most of you wouldn't. In fact, if you go to Dollywood, you think you can buy this hat. So I got it in a leather shop. Go up on Gatlinburg, you can get you two of them for $25. Some of you spend a lot more than that on them. But back this summer, we had a team that landed in Nicaragua. And they got out and they went in, and it was the best day of Nicaragua ministry life for us as a church. Because there was music blaring. There were people everywhere. There were kids running around. There were balloons. There was a big red ribbon. Drew and Tyler was there. And you should have seen the scene. Some of it's still on the internet. Tyler, 6'4", whatever he weighs, walking around as a leader of the church, sees the scene, and he's just uh, crying. That's what Tyler does. He cries. He's emotionally into it. Uh, He was captured. And Drew's there trying to explain what's going on. And there was a Nicaraguan church that was going to open the doors of their church building for the first time. And what you may not realize was two or three years ago, we had sent a team down there, and this team had led two people to Christ. We came home, and they went back, and that, those two people had led the whole town to Christ. And then we went back, and they said, we don't have a place to meet that's big enough. And so we began to talk and work with them, and here's what we said is, we can afford generously to buy property and build the building that they can't afford to buy or build because we believe it's that important. So generously you, generously you spent several thousand dollars, and I say several, probably about five thousand dollars, purchased land in Nicaragua. Don't you wish you could do that here? Purchased land in Nicaragua, put together a church, and on this particular Sunday morning, there was Nicaraguans going in to a place that they couldn't have provided for themselves. They could not build it for themselves, but they had to have someone generously show up so that they could meet and minister to the community for Jesus Christ. And in that moment, before they cut the red, the red ribbon. He, Drew was there, and the Nicaraguans came up, and they said, what you have done is priceless, and you have given us a gift. 
and we want to give you a gift. And they presented to him this leather hat. And you say, well, that's a nice gesture. Let me explain something to you. This leather hat costs more than you want to spend on it. This leather hat represents a whole church building. This leather hat represents an acre of land in another country that the people of God who needed it couldn't purchase it. This leather hat is the equivalent of a little girl accepting Christ for the first time. This leather hat is that drunk in Nicaragua finally coming to Jesus, sobering up, and being a man of God to his family. This leather hat represents all the hands that are raised and the mouths that are speaking in Spanish this morning, praising a God that we one day will worship together in heaven with. This leather hat is priceless. But this leather hat was given in poverty. It's all they could afford. They couldn't buy brick and mortar, but they could sacrifice a cow. And they couldn't lay the cinder block, but they could stitch the edges. And they might not have been able to put the sign up, but they could etch the name in the side of the brim. Let me ask you a question. Are you generous? You want to put a price on that? I'm telling you, the plane's ready. And God says, love me with your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let's be generous. God, I love you. I thank you so much for this morning.